Hello and good morning. Welcome to worship here at Bread of Life Deaf Lutheran Church. I'm Michelle Lewis. I'm the pastor here at Bold, and we're thrilled that you could join us for worship today. Hello, I'm Dorothy Sparks. I'm a deacon here at Bold, and I'm glad you could join us today as well. And I'm David Evans, ASL interpreter. Dorothy's saying, today is February 14th. Today is a really special day. First, we celebrate the Lord's Supper today so gather your bread and your cup, because we'll be using those later in the worship service. Pastor Michelle is saying, and today is also special because it's Transfiguration Day. Dorothy said, ah, yeah. I was thinking more about Valentine's Day, not really, Transfiguration Day. Valentine's Day reminds us of love, of amazing love. At least two St. Valentines are honored by the church on this day. We know little about them, but we know that they loved and cared for Christians who were suffering. And because of their love and care for others, they were martyred. And so that's why we honor Valentine's Day originally. The church in Ireland still honors Valentine's Day as a saint's day. Pastor Michelle is saying, those saints were transfigured. In order to love the way that Jesus loves us. Dorothy, would you mind explaining what transfigured means? Dorothy's saying, sure. Transfiguration just means change. However, it's not a small change. It's a total change. And the end result doesn't look like the beginning at all. With Jesus's transfiguration, a blinding light reflects off of Jesus and Moses and Elijah. The disciples, it seems, aren't really sure what exactly they're seeing. Michelle's saying, wow, that's amazing and really hard to imagine. Dorothy says, it is. I've experienced transfiguration in my own life. In 2008, I had a heart valve replacement and then in 2016, I suffered a stroke. And looking back, I can see that God was with me through those times. There was so much help. And so now I don't worry. I know and I trust God is with me. And it's indescribable. Pastor Michelle saying, wow, thank you, Dorothy, for sharing that.
friends, that we pray that you would experience your own transfiguration today. Open your hearts and your minds and know that God is with you. So now's the time. Go ahead and light a candle in your home or wherever you happen to be. And we'll do that here as well as we enter into worship. Dorothy, in this season of waiting, of longing, of looking for you to come into our world, we all say together, we are seeking light. Deacon Dorothy, in our own lives, our neighborhoods, our families, we say together, we are are seeking light. Deacon Dorothy, in our work, our country, our world, we say together, we are seeking light. Deacon Dorothy, Jesus promises that when we seek, you shall find knock and the door will be opened ask and it will be given to you amen pastor michelle greeting blessed be the holy trinity One God, source of life that gave us birth. Fountain of living water. Our light and our salvation. Prayer for the day. Lord Jesus, you are dazzling. In blinding light, you revealed to your disciples a hint of your power and purpose. Reveal yourself to us today. How will you have us care for others? How will you magnify our kindness so that the world is amazed by you too? Amaze us today, Lord Jesus, just as you amazed your disciples on that mountain so long ago. Amen. My friends, I want to take a moment and introduce our gospel lesson. Since our last gospel reading in chapter 7, uh, Jesus had called the 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. 
And that Jesus sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. That's at the beginning of chapter 9. And the disciples go out in pairs. And then they come back. And they feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And they do that from five loaves of bread and two fishes. And they collect the leftovers. And they have 12 big baskets full of leftovers. And then Jesus quizzes the disciples, asks them, who do the crowds say that I am? And the disciples say, well, some say you're John the Baptist. And others say that you're Elijah. And still others say you are a prophet that's come back to life. And then Jesus says, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, who is often quick to answer, Peter says, you are God's Messiah. You are God's anointed one. And then Jesus says to his closest friends and followers, the disciples, soon I will die. Soon I will suffer and die. And then about a week later, with all of these experiences, these questions and these insights sort of mingling together for the disciples, Jesus takes three of the disciples on a prayer retreat. They climb the mountain for a time of prayer and meditation. And in the midst of that prayer, something amazing happens. And that is our gospel lesson for today. About eight days after Jesus had said these things, he took Peter, John, and James, and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. The next day, when Jesus, Peter, John, and James had come down from the mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to take a look at my son, my only child. Look, a spirit seizes him, and without any warning, he screams. It shakes him and causes him to foam at the mouth. It tortures him and rarely leaves him alone. I begged your disciples to throw it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered, Faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you? And put up with you.
bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw the child down and shook him violently. Jesus spoke harshly to the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. While everyone was marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, take these words to heart. The human one is about to be delivered into human hands. The disciples didn't understand this statement. Its meaning was hidden from them, so they couldn't grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. The Gospel of Luke. My friends, grace and peace to you from our God, our Creator our Redeemer, and the Spirit that gives us life. Well, it's been a long time since I've been with you and preached, so it's um, kind of been like, how do, I, how do I do this again? But I think I remember... Uh, my point, I always try to share uh, the very beginning. What's my point for today? So my point is that Jesus, in our gospel lesson today, Jesus is preparing his disciples to take up Jesus's work. And that's what Jesus is doing with us, too. And often... We are just like the disciples, and we think we can't do it. But Jesus gives us his power and authority to continue this work of healing and restoring the world. The work of sharing the good news that God loves us and so yes yes we can accomplish jesus work in our lives and in the world that is my point for today <sighs> so recently I took some time away, uh, went to a little hermitage. I needed some simplicity and space and some solitude. I just needed to get away to pray. I think maybe lots of us are feeling that way, staying at home with our families all the time. And so my kids and my husband were all jealous. They were like, we want to go instead of you. So my time away, my time of prayer really started before I left my home. Because I was praying for my husband and for my children and for my dog. It was praying for the time that I was gone and for myself, that I would attend to the Lord. I would be focused on the Lord and not be distracted. Because as I entered that time away, I felt worn out and unsure. I really felt disconnected from Jesus and from God 
and from the spirit, the spirit who goes with us everywhere, just felt disconnected. And as I arrived at my little hermitage, this little cabin, I unpacked my too many bags. I brought too much stuff. But I got out my coffee and my books and my note paper. And I breathed, I prayed breath prayers as I unpacked and got settled in. And as the sun was sinking low, I sat in the rocking chair and watched the sky change. And in the midst of these prayers, this settling in and slowing down, something amazing happened. I wasn't alone. Now, if anyone had peeked inside my little cabin, they would have only seen me. But I was not alone. As I looked through my different binders and books and folders and things, I found mementos and pictures. I found poems and reminders that I carry with me most of the time but reminders of the many, many people who are praying for me. And those reminders brought to mind many others who have shaped my faith and my life. And so you see, I wasn't alone. In many ways, in that time away, I was transfigured. My face and clothes didn't change, but my sense of connection to God, to Jesus, and to the Holy Spirit, that changed. My sense of connection to those who love me and pray for me, that changed. I went into that little hermitage alone, but I was not left there on my own. My grounding and confidence in God grew stronger my relationship with Jesus, the way that God works through my life was refreshed. I found new strength, a strength to keep going and strength and courage to do what is put before me. I wonder if this is what it was like or what happened for Jesus and those three disciples on the mountain. Their sense of connection to God and to one another changed in that time of prayer. Their sense of their connection to those who love them and pray for them changed in that prayer. The strength to keep going was renewed. And for Jesus in particular, he received strength and courage to do what was put before him to do. So in their prayer retreat, Jesus and these disciples are renewed.
And, you know, they're walking down the mountain now. Their retreat time is over and they're walking back down the mountain. And as soon as they get down to the bottom, they're confronted with the concerns of their ministry. Similar for me, that experience. Now, do you remember at the beginning when I did the introduction before Dorothy signed the gospel lesson? I said that Jesus had sent the disciples out in pairs and they had the power and authority that Jesus gave them to drive out demons, to cure diseases. They were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Jesus sends those disciples out to prepare them for the day when Jesus is not there with them anymore. So they come down the mountain and they are confronted with a crowd of people asking questions. And very quickly, Jesus feels frustrated and worried about the disciples. Because the first person who gets Jesus' attention is a father with a very sick child asking Jesus to heal that child. And the father says, I asked your disciples to do it, but they couldn't do it. So it seems that the disciples, when they went out in their pairs to heal and to cast out demons, they didn't trust themselves. And it seems that the community didn't trust them either. And so they all were waiting for Jesus to heal this sick child. Now, Jesus heals this precious one, this sick child, Jesus heals him. But first he speaks very firmly to all of those people. And I think this is some sort of what he's getting at. Jesus says something like, you have so little faith in yourselves. And you have so little faith in one another. I gave you my power, my authority to drive out demons and to heal the sick. But you did not trust it. Instead, you just wait for me. But I won't always be with you. Soon I will die. Now the disciples cannot accept and they can't understand what Jesus is trying to tell them. They just don't get it. Now, we also can be guilty of this kind of behavior of like waiting for someone else to do it. It doesn't always have to be a big thing like healing a very sick child. It can also be as simple as seeing a request for helping somebody get into the church building and then ignoring that request. Thinking, well, someone else will do it. Another person out there will help them. It does, I don't need to do it. And not communicating and leaving that somebody, that person asking for help, leaving them without information, they don't know what's going on. Or perhaps it's just like kind of hoping maybe the issue will go away. No, nobody will have to do anything about it. Now, my example of like somebody needing to get in the church building and nobody helping with that issue it's nowhere close to as dire as this little child who's sick. 
but it's an indicator of our habits, right? It might be, it might be an indicator that we, I believe someone else is more important and that they'll do that work. Like, like I'm not, it doesn't matter if I do it. Another more important person will take care of it. Or it could be an indicator like that we are really suspicious of other people. And we're not, we don't really believe what they're saying to us. Or maybe it's an indicator that it is somebody else's job to help care for the whole community. Not me, it's not my responsibility. Now, any of those indicators could suggest to us that we don't believe in ourselves that we can change the world. I know opening the door at the church building, it's not like changing the world, but it allows someone access. It lets people get involved. It says, oh, I respect your time. I care for you. And you're part of my community, so I'm gonna help take care of you. But if we always look at those opportunities, or even if we occasionally look at those opportunities as somebody else's responsibility, it seems like maybe we don't believe that Jesus has given us power and authority and responsibility to care for one another. But Jesus says the opposite thing. Jesus says, I call you. I teach you. I give you power and authority to heal and to restore one another. Do it. But I wonder, too, if this is like a dance of faith. We get to dance in our lives. We witness and we get to be part of stories when people are healed. They have these amazing experiences in our community. Like those disciples going out and healing and caring for others in their in those little towns that they go to in our faith we get to be connected through times of prayer feeling united with god and with one another and then we kind of backslide we forget to trust ourselves because God trusts us. And we start waiting and waiting and waiting for Jesus to come and rescue us. And then we kind of get to be part of it all again, right? Where we live into our faith. We witness people being healed sharing the experiences together, praying together, all of those things. And then hopefully in this dance of faith, the next time we don't slide back quite so far. We hope that this time we remember for a little longer that Jesus gives to us his power and authority to use here and now. Power and authority to drive out the demons that haunt our lives and our communities. 
power and authority to heal the sick and serve those who are in need. Power and authority to share the promises and hope that we have in God. So my friends, we are called to have faith in Jesus. Jesus says, come, follow me. Have faith in me. And, and we are called to have faith in ourselves because Jesus has faith in us. And we are called to have faith in our communities. Not just those few people that we know really well, but the whole community. Because you see, Jesus is preparing the disciples to take up his work. The same way Jesus is preparing us to take up Jesus' work. And often we think, I can't do it. I can't do it. But my friends, Jesus gives us his power and authority to continue this work of healing and restoring one another, sharing the good news that God loves us. So yes, 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 we can accomplish Jesus' work in our lives and in our world. Amen. Now we invite you to type in your prayer requests into the YouTube chat box or the comment box. What people and situations would you like to bring to our time of prayer? Go ahead and share those with us now. And then together, we will pray. Lord Jesus, light of the world, accept our prayers. Use us to reflect your light. So that places of darkness in our world would have your light. Then all nations will be drawn to you and overwhelmed with joy. Amen.
At the birth of Christ, the angels sang a song of peace and good news for all. That good news is that the peace of the Lord is with you always. Deacon Dorothy is saying, also with you. Pastor Michelle is saying, please share the peace from God with one another. For those of you at home, that might mean sending a text, an email, a handwritten note. But however you do it, take a few moments to share God's peace with one another. Ah, uh, we arrive at our offering time again this week. And every week it sort of feels like, peace, blessings to you. Now we need some money. But that is a part of our um, practice of faith, right? We share peace with one another. And then we share part of our wallets with our church because as we've talked about before our money really is like one thing that we all care about and so when we share our money with our church we get more invested in our church and our church here at bread of life is a special place because God has given us special work to do. And um, as we like her, as in my sermon, I talked about how Jesus is asking us to continue his work. That's what God is doing too. God asks us to continue this work. And what is it that we do? We share the good news that God loves us. And we do that particularly with the deaf community, people who are deaf and their families. The promise that God loves deaf people and their families. And here at Bread of Life, we love deaf people and their families. And so we, every week, we ask for your financial support because it's not free to do this work. And we need your help. So we ask that you could send a check to Bread of Life or you could use PayPal um, to make donations to our church. And we also need people helping, right? So if you have ideas, if you have some um, things you want to do if you're feeling lonely and you want to get a little more involved, there are always opportunities. And even though we're separated because of COVID, there's still opportunities to get involved. We can do lots of things. It's pretty amazing. An offering prayer. Good teacher, in your life, you show us how to live. How to live with compassion, peace, and generosity. Bless our gifts with your love, so we use it for your purpose in our world. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is our duty and our delight that we should everywhere and always give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you make all things new. In the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness, you will make all things new. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. We invite you to sign the holy, holy with us. This will not be in spoken English. On Jesus' last night, when he gathered to eat with his friends and followers, he was betrayed. Our Lord Jesus took bread. Thank God. Blessed it and broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup, thanked God, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new agreement in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We invite you to sign the Lord's Prayer with us. This will not be in spoken English. We are many. Because we take the one bread, we become one body in Christ. So come and eat. Be filled with Christ's light and life. All are invited to this table. For this table belongs to God. And we are honored to share it with anyone 
who desires to feast. When you serve one another, we ask you to use language similar to this, with the bread, body of Christ given for you. With the cup, blood of Christ shed for you. And for those of you who may be alone, I will administer the bread and the cup for you. Body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. God gathers us together and God sends us from this place. As you go, receive this blessing. God of glory lives in you, names you beloved, shines brightly on your path. Amen. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord, be the light of Christ. And we all say together, thanks be to God. Amen.